My name is uh, Dr. James Rogers, uh, and I'm running for U.S. Congress in Texas District 30. There are, there again, there's importance between Bitcoin and, and the altcoins out there, uh, and they are alt for a reason. Uh, they do not have that same value. So that's my big sell point there. Actually, when I said I knew nothing about economics, I lied. Because I actually I, know... I figured, I figured, you dropped yeah. some knowledge on me. Uh, I actually know a little bit about supply and demand, but that's it. So I think how Bitcoin works is there's a set amount, it starts at an extremely low price, and then once people buy it, less become available. Since there's less supply and more demand, then the price starts get going up. Then to have them each individually and walk up to them. It's kind of like a bit more time consuming. Now, I'm not a movie Hence buff. why I'm on your podcast. Hence why I'm on this show. This, <laughs> this is my crowd. I can show them that. Conversation with Global Professor, hosted by Saborno Isaac. Politician Dr. James Rogers. In fact, he got his PhD from Baylor University, one of the top universities in Texas and the United States. So, um, first of all, can you give me a sort of Wikipedia version of your life? Um, I mean, can you give me a summary of your aspirations, uh, who's in your family, and most importantly, what's your name? I think it's obvious. Okay. Yeah, we'll start with that. My name is uh, Dr. James Rogers, uh, and I'm running for U.S. Congress in Texas District 30. I'm uh, currently in a for the GOP nomination, and uh, after we vanquish that that uh, rival right there, we're going to move on to the general election um, for the for the congressional seat. Uh, I was born in Waco, Texas, just down the road from Dallas, where I live now. I uh, got my start. I was going to be a football coach like everybody else. And when I got into teaching, I just saw a lot of problems in schools. And I really also fell in love with the, the teaching aspect. I loved it, being around the kids and, and problem solving. It was a lot less pressure than also coaching football in Texas. Then. So I did that. And I wanted to do more than just be a teacher. I wanted to, to kind of maximize uh, the amount of good I could do and, and fix some of the problems that I felt had easy solutions. So uh, after uh, getting my bachelor's at Baylor, I went and got my master's at Florida. I uh, went and got my doctorate at Baylor and uh, w moved from, you know, up the teaching ladder to being a team lead and department head and all those things and uh, eventually became an administrator. Uh, and in doing that, I worked all over. I worked in uh, New York a couple times and London. I bounced around a little in Florida and then all over Texas. And um kind of saw the same same issues uh, that they were more systematic failures to to our education system and uh, the further up that I went the less I was actually able to influence change whereas you know as a teacher I could influence change with my students and um, once I got into administration boy it all became very clear about you know the some of the issues as far as funding and things like that so got out and now I'm a recruiter with a network of international Christian schools uh, so um, a nonprofit. It's a little uh, more academic freedom for the people I hire and everything. So, I also uh, have a wife. I, I got her uh, when I was in New York. I kidnapped her back to Texas, uh, figuratively speaking. Uh, she had our first baby uh, uh, in let's see, February, right before the pandemic started, 2020, and uh, somehow she got pregnant again. And so now she's going to have our our second child, a little boy here in May. And so I'm uh, real excited about that. And that that's that's as much of a Wikipedia as I could. It's more than a tweet. It's a, it's a lot more characters than that. But hmm. that that's as uh, as concise as I can get, uh, for anybody who knows me. Um, all right. So hopefully kidnapping is just the Texan word for relocating. But uh, yes. now the yes. second question. Um, can you please ex um, explain that Cowboys flag you have back on your wall? The Cowboys flag? Uh, well, that's, I, I, you know, Baylor and Florida's uh, were my alma maters. And so uh, are my alma maters. I don't know if we say were in the past tense. And then, yeah, I'm a, I'm a diehard Cowboys fan. Uh, we just, uh, and, and the Spurs fan, I don't mention that as much up here in running for office in Dallas. There's too many Mavs fans. But yeah, diehard, diehard Cowboys. That was why I got into teaching. I was going to be the next Tom Landry. Um, 
And uh, then, uh, then, then fate took me somewhere else down this path. Uh, they just traded Amari Cooper. Only got a fifth round pick back. So uh, I'm a little, I'm a little perplexed at some of these moves they're making lately. But yeah, diehard, diehard Cowboys fan. It comes into to play in the family dynamics. My wife um, is a heathen. Uh, is not a Cowboys fan. She is roots for the the Giants of New York. Uh, I've been trying to pray for her soul and convert her as best I can. Uh, but we're working on it. It's a one day, one day at a time kind of deal. I guess nobody cares about the Islanders. I'm not really caring. Uh, I'm not really keeping up with sports anyway. But um, second of all, you talked about uh, you talked quite a lot about education and how you wanted to fix the system um, during those parts of your uh, Wikip- many Wikipedia. So, uh, could you ex- please explain how do you plan to fix the education system? You only really mentioned something about funding. Yeah, so there's a couple of different issues with education uh, that I think people, people assume that schools are run the way they are because it's the best model. And really, we have a system that is, um, for lack of a better term, kind of a Frankenstein system. And so we have different pieces that were adapted for different reasons and we've just kept them because people grew up with them. And so this, you hear this a lot from parents, like, well, that's, that's the way I did it. And so it must be the way that we should continue to do it. Um, the first is the factory model, right? So uh, if you've ever noticed when you go to a school, um, as a professor, you know, I'm sure you teach many kids, but there's a bell that tells you when you're supposed to go to things. And, yep. you know, kids sit in these little rows and the teacher's at the front and the teacher's uh, kind of the, the giver of knowledge. And um, so the, the bells and all that, that's the factory model. It was this idea that came about uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, because we were just going to train kids to be factory workers, right? Post-industrial revolution. Uh, and we've just kept that, even though society is vastly different. Now, what we have done is we tweak the model to where instead of becoming factory models, the factory product is now college education. But that doesn't work because A, not every kid should go to college and B, not every job is preparing, is, needs college preparedness. So, um, but we have this model where every kid is pushed to college. So the other thing is, uh, the big one is traditional learning model, right? We, we have historically lots of different models, whether it's progressive education and, and constructivist behaviors. And we used to have a, di- you know, a dynamic array of different types of schools but uh, we had what they call the Red Scare in this country where we were really afraid of communists. Of course. And so because we were, right, of course, you gotta be scared of the communists. And so because of that, they thought we have to control what people learn very tightly. And so what we end up with is traditional learning models where the teacher is at the front, the students are in the, the, the rows, the teacher is the giver of knowledge, the students are the receptacles for this knowledge, And all information, and and this is why you see a lot of teachers who love lecture, right? And while if you sit there and and you've learned, done some learning styles, you know, only about a third of kids are audible learners, right? We have visual learners, kinesthetic learners, kids who need to, you know, that's, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I need to see it and then I can get up and do it. And I, I, you know, I don't think I'm a dumb guy, but just sitting and listening is hard for me to, to, you know, unless it's the lyrics to to a Johnny Cash song, you know, it's hard for me to remember that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's okay, don't, don't judge me. And so, but we still do this because lectures are the easiest, especially for new teachers, right? They control the pace, they control the content, there's no student back and forth, it's just, and you see this with new, if you ever have a young teacher who's really scared, I'm just gonna keep talking and I'm gonna get louder if I have to, but I'm gonna keep talking and talking because I am controlling the classroom and you can't talk. And, and so we do this thing, but again, why do we do this? Well, it's because we were scared of, of, of uh, you know, communist infiltration. And the next big piece is uh, we have a ranked curricula now, right? Like all these, you know, math and science are up here at the top and you know we don't do anything with hands-on learning. We don't teach shop anymore. We we you know social studies is way at the bottom. And how that came about was the National Defense and Education Act in the '50s. Sputnik. The Soviets beat us in Sputnik, and it, and a bunch of government people look around. And it's like whoa, we really need scientists and engineers. So they give a ton of funding to science and math. And when you tie funding to certain subjects, kids take it as, well, these are the important subjects and these are not. And I'd have administrators be like, well, math is the most important. Why? 
Well, because that's funding, but why, why? And they, well, it just, it's the most important. It's like, no, 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 but, but why they could not tell you. Whereas if you look at a real academic curriculum, the Academy back in Athens, you know, Plato, Socrates, and all those guys, uh, an academic curriculum included oratory skills and the gymnasium. And there was this idea that you had to, to just, you know, be a, a fully rounded person to be, uh, you know, an educated person, I would say an educated man, because they were sexist back in Athens, but an educated person, because we'll be more egalitarian now. Uh, and yet we've gotten away from that. And it gets more and more ranked based on how we do funding and testing, which is the last one, which is in the 80s, a nation at risk comes out and says schools are horrible. American schools are not learning anything. Uh, you have to overlook the fact that everybody else in the world was trying to, you know, uh, immigrate here, trying to imitate our, our education models. But they were like, nope, 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 they're horrible. And we needed to go to, and we end up with bubble dot tests. That's where you get all this, this advent of we're going to test everything, high stakes testing. And this testing, it controls funding. It controls whether kids pass. It controls whether teachers should get another job, whether administrators are doing well. When really these assessments can only tell you to a point whether a kid can take a test. I had kids that were just brilliant when it came to taking tests and, and as far as traditional bubble dot tests. Uh, and then you would do an oral test and they could not explain their ideas. They were just really good at taking tests. And I had other kids who couldn't take these tests to save their lives. They got too much anxiety. They'd start sitting and overthinking. And then in government, when I teach them or economics, we would do something project based or uh, something, you know, an, an oral test where they get to explain and they'd ace it. And so that that goes to the idea of there's multiple intelligences. There's multiple ways of learning styles. And those are completely ignored. And so what you end up with is a factory model that's pushing everybody to go to college. They're going to college specifically. They need to find math and science degrees. And then the other piece is they're only going to be tested in standardized ways that are going to be built around being an auditory learner, being very compliant and good at literacy early on. And we know that this loses whole swaths of the population and all this stuff, but we're just kind of like, eh, eh, this is the system. And so um, that is, that's kind of where we are with it, um, the problems, and, and it is tied mostly to funding because people want to think of schools as these very, uh, um, you know, um, you have great people in schools. And so, you, have, you know, the teachers especially just, they care so much, the administrators care so much. But in the end, if funding is tied to these certain things and they have to have funding to stay a school, they're going to focus on those. They become they become poorly run businesses where the kids aren't the product, test scores are the product, or keeping them seated till 10.30 when tax credits kick in are the product, or going to college if you're the counselor. They're measured on how many kids go to college, whether a kid wants to be a welder or you know go do an internship out in Silicon Valley or whatever. And so we really, uh, for lack of a better term, I wanna take a sledgehammer to the whole model. I wanna redo it and make sure that we create this, uh, you know, buffet of options because we have a diverse society and we need diverse offerings. Wouldn't you agree, Professor, with my rant? Mm -hmm. I, of course, agree. And um, the thing is, in these kinds of uh, environments, if we don't have students that are talking freely and just a teacher who's spouting out information that sounds kind of useless, um, for two hours straight, and they only let us ask questions at the end. Everybody's going to forget the material. Nobody's going to see anything notable. And since nobody is able to discuss between each other, we don't get a free flow of new ideas, just a select part of the content. So that means that really we're not advancing in mathematics or science in the classroom. We're teaching which already know. So that means we're kind of limiting ourselves. The entire classroom is built by the shackles of the teacher's own imagination. So now, uh, right? It's I want to build on it. So it's not a collaborative learning environment, right? Where the teacher and the student are partners in advancing learning. It's you're only going to go as far as that teacher goes. And with the way we have teacher shortages and teachers are overworked and underpaid and the best teachers have to carry for all these newbie teachers that you get, you end up with a really limited scope. Kind of like you said, you're only going to go as far as that that teacher you get. And it's not every, it's not equal, right? Every you know, the best teachers are in the best schools and the schools that have the, the highest needs are kind of left with who they can get. And, you know, sometimes it's just a warm body who, who won't hurt the children is who you can get, you know, we have to put those people at the bus drivers, right? That's, 
that's how that goes. Mm. Yeah, um, most of the best teachers are at the best schools. And then, you know what happens with people who can't afford those best schools? They get undereducated and they're left to work at the bottom of society.